All right, let's go to myths. Let's talk about some myths. Grounding myths. Here we go. Ready? All right, here we go, right? <laughs> Grounding provides a path necessary to clear a ground fault. How do we clear ground faults? Oh, it's one of number four or number five somewhere in our list of things there. Well, in order to clear a ground fault, you have to have what? You have to have an effective ground fault current path, which low impedance from the point of a fault back to the source. Take a look at this graphic. You take a pole when you take it and you drive it in a ground rod and you got a 25 ohm ground contact resistance and you have 120 volts. Well, Ohm's law, I is equal to E over R. 120 divided by 25 ohms. It's only 4.8 amps. I, you know, and if you're an electrician, electrical contractor, and I've done this at my seminars in different places, just drive a ground rod, take 120 volts, connect it to it, turn on the breaker. No, it's not going to trip the breaker. It's not supposed to trip the breaker. Scott, did you do this at your shop before? Oh, yeah, we've done that before, sure. We've it, hooked it, it up directly to the secondary of a transformer, done all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> it's not going to trip. But what did the guys think? Well, initially, people go, of course it's going to trip. You know, people, you know, you get, all right, let's turn it on. What happened? <laughs> Nothing. You know, of course not. It's not going to trip. You can weld with it if you want to, but it's not going to trip. You know? All right. Myth number two. Current takes a path of least resistance. We've heard this all our lives. Matter of fact, I've said this when I used to teach grounding and bonding classes. I don't think so. Take a look at this. And by the way, this is an example of something on the Internet. A properly grounded electrical circuit boxes, devices, and service panel grounds that give the electrical current the easiest path to ground and that reduces the chance of someone getting shocked or getting electrocuted. That is absolutely false. Down at the bottom, the earth absorbs the overcurrent or short circuit harmlessly and having done so eliminates the threat to anyone that may have otherwise been the grounded path. Are you kidding me? This is live stuff on the internet, what people are saying, that grounding provides path to the earth, it makes it safe, it doesn't make it safe. Let's take a look at the graphic. Here is a pole. This is a typical utility installation. The electric utilities do not have an equipment grounding conductor, and, and, but they'll drive a ground rod next to it and connect it to the pole. Well, if you have a 120 volt fault, we saw previously the current of a 120 volt fault was only what? 4.8 amps. There was the math right there. So take a look right here. You got 4.8 amps. Yeah, a male dog will go take a leak on the pole. And there have been male dogs taking leak on poles that have died. That happened in Illinois, where Illinois had uh, traffic signals. And they didn't, have no, they didn't have any ground rods at all. And a male dog took a leak and died. And they're like, oh, my gosh. Man, we got it. So it could have been a person. They went around. They drove ground rods. That was in 1970. In the year 2000, another male dog took a leak on a pole in Illinois. Okay? Got killed, owned by a female attorney. You know, this is the kind of stuff you don't want to do. Kill dogs owned by female attorneys. Well, guess what? They got me involved in it. They ran an equipment grounding conductor to every single thing, all the equipment. Do they still drive ground rods? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because we've been driving ground rods at bowls. I mean, it didn't work before, but it doesn't matter. We drive ground rods. No, ground rods serves no purpose. What serves a purpose is what? An equipment grounding conductor. So anybody making a statement that grounding makes it safe, electrons are trying to go to ground, is false. Here's another myth. Grounding brings everything to a zero potential. This reduces touch and step voltage to a safe value. Absolutely false. Here's an example. If you have a pole that's grounded with no equipment grounding conductor, you will not clear the fault, and you will create a voltage gradient in the soil itself, right across the surface. And if you are three feet away, that voltage gradient will be about 75% of the applied voltage. So on a 120-volt circuit, 75% will be 90% volts. How does that work out? Well, this gets really, really, really complicated. So you might be like, I don't understand what it is. Oh, just trust me. You know what? Don't even trust me. Go drive a ground rod, put an amp meter on there, measure the current, go three feet away, realize it's 90 volts, three feet away, and realize maybe it's something you shouldn't even do in the first place because you can get killed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you got to really, really <laughs> be under some home. kind of controlled mm -hmm. environment to understand. You're taking, think about it, you're taking a 120 volt wire, you're putting it on a rod, which means the rod is how many volts? 120. 120 volts. The voltage doesn't go away, you can't get rid of voltage, and now you stick it in the dirt, it's 120 volts at the rod, but it's zero volts at the source, which means what? There's a voltage gradient, and it's not linear. It is this huge gradient rise right near the electrode, and it has a function of the resistance, contact resistance of the electrode to the soil, and this is in the, uh, the, the, um, the green book, IEEE green book, I think it's 142 is the book number. Yeah. And I think this is table four or something like that. And it shows you the distance from electrode, what the percentage of the resistance is. 
If you go one-tenth of a foot away from an electrode, that represents 25% of the resistance of that circuit, which is the Earth. If you go a half of a foot away, it represents 52% of the resistance of the Earth. And if you go five feet away, it represents 86%. All right. Here it is. One-tenth of a foot away is 25% of the resistance. 25% of the voltage is equal to 30 volts. This is really difficult to understand. What we're saying is that you drive a ground rod, it's 25 ohms. But the Earth, the Earth itself has zero impedance. The Earth is fine. You can use the Earth as a conductor. Tesla. I mean, he's, he's all into that stuff, trying to use the Earth as a conductor, send out magnetic fields, right, the waveforms, and be able to have it come back. The problem with Tesla is that it doesn't come with connections. The Earth doesn't come with connections. So you got to do it. So now you got to stick something in the Earth. When you stick something in the Earth, guess what? It's a high contact resistance. The Earth has all these parallel paths. That's why the Earth itself is a good conductor, because it has, what, 8,000 miles of diameter of a parallel path, which is great. But the problem is when you make a connection at each, at each end or when you make a connection at one end, that contact resistance is high. And when you make the immediate connection to that location, what you have is you have very little soil right there. And then it gets, what, more soil. Then you get more soil and more paths and more paths and more paths. Take a look at the graphic here. So if you're one foot away, you have a certain amount of paths. And one foot away is, represents 68% of the resistance. And if you go three feet away, well, now you've done what? You've increased your paths. In other words, you've got more pa paths to work from, okay? Well, if you have more paths to work from, well, then it's, you know, it's resistance. When you get about 25 feet away, basically, you, now guess what? Now you're in the earth. Now you're back into all those parallel paths. So it takes about 25 feet radius, which is what? A 50 foot in diameter. So now, if you understand that the voltage drop of circuit Okay, Kirchhoff's law of a closed-loop circuit says that the voltage drop of all the resistors in a circuit equal the voltage source. 120-volt circuit, what's the voltage drop of all the resistors? 120. If you know the distribution of the resistance of the circuit, well, then you know the distribution of voltage because voltage is directly proportional to the resistance. So let's look at this table here. I know this is a complicated concept, trust me. If one-tenth of a foot away because of the contact to the soil represents 25% of resistance of the circuit, and we're only talking about the Earth, well, then 25% of the voltage of the circuit is 30 volts. And if you go half a foot away, it's 52% of the resistance of the contact. Well, then it's 52% of the voltage, which is 62 volts, and then three feet goes to 90 volts. So let's go over here. This is not the scale, and I'd like to have this one the scale. Maybe we can make one the scale. This is, let's say this was for purposes of convenience. If this was 120 feet long, you with me, guys? And 120 volt fault, then what would be the voltage drop of the 120 feet earth only? What's the voltage drop in volts? 120. How many volts? 120. 120, 120 across all. Okay, time. now, here's what I thought. Well, if I have 120 feet, I have 120 volts, well, then there'd be how many voltage drop per foot? In my mind, would be what? One volt drop per foot, right? I mean, voltage drop is linear. But the problem is this, the Earth is a good conductor. It's the contact at one point that's the high resistance. So voltage is not linear. Voltage is a function of, well, how much resistance does it represent? And the represented the resistance is shown on this table here. Well, the first shell of resistance was one foot. 68% of the resistance, well, 68% of resistance is gonna be 68% of the voltage. And if you go three feet away, well, that represented 75% of the resistance, which is 90 volts, which is 90 volts. And so that's why grounding does not bring anything to a zero potential. All it does, it creates a voltage gradient. So no, let's go to myth number four. More grounding, the better. I mean, come on. I mean, like, you know, I mean, we all have done that. Like, wow, you know what, you know, 80, 80. 2 octane, 87 octane, 90 octane, 91. Hey, you know, they got some, there's a special fuel that, you know, that you can get 107 octane, 140 octane. No, you don't want to put higher octane in your vehicle. You're spending more money, and there's a good chance you're going to damage the equipment. Do you guys know that? 
How many guys know that in here? Raise your hand if you know that. Yeah, on the I'm, I'm too yeah. cheap to buy it anyway. I know, but, but some people would think, well, yeah. you know what? But if you got more money, you might say, hey, you know what? I, I want to do a little better job. My car, I love my car. It's a brand new car. Let me put, no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. But more grounding. Man, I'll tell you. Understand how octane operates and when you put high octane. No, you don't put something more than's required because you could damage it. Same thing with comes with grounding. You ground for the purpose of what? We have system grounding and we have equipment grounding and we have methods to do that per the NEC. Don't get creative. Let's take a look at these graphics. False. Auxiliary electrode, CNC machines, computer numeric controls. I've, I've been in Boeing in Seattle, Washington area there, and I've been running around in Reddick and, and all the different places, and we're talking massive equipment, computer control machines that do all kinds of great, great, they cost millions and millions of dollars. And the CNC industry, 50% of them say, listen, we want you to make sure you ground this machine. 25% of them say, we want to make sure that you don't ground the machine. And 25% like, well, uh, check with the engineer. I am the engineer. Check with the electrician. I am the electrician. Like, an, uh, I don't know. Whatever you think. Okay. Now, there was a study done about CNC machines, and it says, no, no, you don't want to be grounding a, a multi-million dollar piece of equipment. No. You do it according to the NEC. You don't add an auxiliary electrode. But if you do, the code has rules about that, and we'll talk about those specific later on. Scott. Yeah, as I say, Mike, this really happens in a very practical sense. You get equipment that comes in from overseas. It's got instructions. It says, add a grounded connect, put a ground rod in. And as an electrician, if you do that, okay, but you want to let them know, listen, we're only doing this in accordance with your instructions. That this is not needed. It's not required by the NEC. The next thing you know, their machine doesn't work out, and they come out and try to tell you to unhook your equipment grounding conductor, which is just adding to the myth no way. and creating even more problems. So as contractors... Even though some of these concepts are a little complicated, you have to be very, very careful. You cannot void the rules of the NEC just because some manufacturer from overseas says you drive a ground rod, you unhook everything else, you're messing up my machines because it's a real liability issue as a contractor. All right, let's look at this graphic and let's really bring what Scott is saying. He's saying, look, equipment comes in and the manufacturer says, we need to make sure you ground this. And then things have a problem with the equipment. They say, ah, our problem is grounding. Your electrical system is a dirty ground. There's noise on that. We need to disconnect that. They want to disconnect your ground. Audio guys want to do that. Listen, hopefully at this point, I think it was number four note is what? You need to turn it off in case there's a fault. I think number five was what? Bring an equipment grounding conductor to it. There's nothing else you can do. You cannot violate Number four and number five notes that we have, you can't violate it because if you don't bring an equipment, an effective ground fault current path there, you don't bring an equipment grounding conductor, then you don't go to number four, you don't turn it off, and you're going to kill somebody. But they're not thinking about that because everybody thinks what? No, grounding brings everything to see it potential. It assists in clearing a fault. You know, I mean, electrons are trying to go to ground. All that wrong stuff is causing people to make it dangerous. You need to make sure anybody tells you to get rid of the equipment grounding conductor, you tell them, absolutely not. You need to have total confidence. You're the expert. They're not the expert. You're never going to disconnect that wire. Never going to happen. And they're going to go nuts. I don't care if they go nuts. I'm not going to kill anybody. Now, EPRI, Electrical Power Research Institute, has a document on power quality considerations for CNC machines. It's a BR10717. That's a number. EPRI is the Electrical Power Research Institute. There are people out there that are organizations that do all kinds of studies on electrical power. And EPRI study says this. This is a little cut and paste. However, field experiments experience at sites with the supplemental ground rods have shown that the rod may actually increase the risk of CNC electronic damage. These sites are found to be prone to have damage of internal electronics after thunderstorms or utility system faults. So here these guys got... They really believe that that ground rod is, is the savior. That's how it all works. They don't understand. No, studies have shown you don't want to do this. It makes it worse. Look at the slide. Now, the question, the statement is this. What this, this study says, what is believed to occur is a rise in earth ground potential near the electrode causing a large current to flow on the grounding conductor between the electrodes and passing through the CNC machine. And it says down here, see figure seven. So here's figure seven. Whether it be a lightning strike in the earth or whether it be a fault of utility, look what happens. A fault current. Where's fault trying to go to, guys? Back to the source. Not source. trying to go to ground. So if utility has a wire that's on the ground, it's not, the current's not trying to go to ground. It's trying to get back to where? The source. Every single electrode that's connected to the earth, guess what? In that entire 
Guess what? Look what happens. Current travels on the earth. Oh, you drove a ground rod for your CNC machine? No problem. We'll go up the ground rod through the equipment itself, travel on the equipment grounding conductor, get back over to the building, and then go down. And, oh, here's another one. And go up that one also. That is you have a utility fault. What if you have a lightning generators? I can't tell you how many people want to drive a ground rod at a generator. You got a $10,000 piece of a home generator, standby power. And there's a, well, my, why is there a lug? I, there's a lug on there because there's a UL standard. There'd be a lug on there because there might be an application when you're supposed to use a lug. Okay, you don't always use a, put a wire on a lug because a lug is there. You put a wire on a lug and you connect it to the earth if it's required by the NEC. You know, I know manufacturers have been changing their instructions, and I don't think there's a manufacturer now that will tell you to ground the generator. If there is, let me know, but I think I pretty much got everybody to change that. But what happens if somebody's going back, well, wait a minute now, a generator there, I need you. So the inspector makes you put a lug in, a, a grounding electrode, which, of course, he can't legally, but let's say, you know, you know Mike, I need to get the final here. I got to get going. I want to fight with the inspector. I don't want to upset them. You drive a ground rod. Here's what happens. Lightning strikes the earth. This creates a voltage gradient. It goes over, comes up, goes through the equipment, it goes back down the equipment grounding conductor, over to the circuit of the service, and then back down to the earth. Now, it's not actually traveling on the conductors. If you remember the study that was done with the CNC, it does what? It says that it's creating a magnetic pulse. It's, 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 if you don't have electronics. In other words, if you got a disconnect out there, who cares? You know, you're not, you're not, it's electronics that are being affected by this electrical, this DC high pulse current. Here's another one. The 2014 code is going to allow, because auxiliary electrodes are permitted. In other words, this is not a violation of the code. You can add electrode if you want to. You want to go to that CNC machine, Scott? Let's go back here. You want to put electrode there? Sure. Okay. Code-wise, yeah. yeah. We don't think it's a good idea, but hey. Just don't unhook your equipment ground again, Doctor. But don't, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> you put in a generator. Here's the problem. Now the 2014 code is allowing you and recognizing that you might want to take the array and connect it to the earth. Oh my gosh. Last thing you want to do is take a $20,000, $50,000, solar PV system that's all electronic, right? The whole thing is electronic. And now make a connection to the earth from the array, then make a connection at the, the service. Now take a look at the current. Current travels on the earth. It goes up that beautiful connection you made, goes through your, your PV uh, array system, it goes down to the equipment grounding conductor, goes through the inverter, and now gets to the earth, and it gets back to where it's going to go to. Last thing you want to do that. But the people who are driving ground rods at arrays, they genuinely believe, listen, man, and I've talked to them, they, you know what they think it's for? Lightning protection. I said, hold on, hold on. That's not how lightning protection works. You, you don't take an array and then ride, drive a ground rod to array to protect lightning protection. If you're trying to protect something, you actually have to put it around it, not, 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 not make it part of that, you know? So that doesn't, you gotta go to NFPA 780. Let's go to the next myth. We're almost done with this whole stuff here. Grounding a light pole is necessary and required by the NEC. False. In other words, you know, why do we drive a ground without a pole? Well, uh, I'm thinking the reason why, because uh, that's the way we always do it, because it told me, I'm still thinking, I like hitting stuff with hammers. Uh, there is no mm. reason. But, but why do people put in CNC? They, they really believe it. Why do they put a generator? They really believe it. Why would they put in an array? They really believe that more grounding is better. But let's just use the logic. Let's just take the pole as a simple example, okay? Let's take a look. Guy drives a ground rod. He makes a connection to it. Look at that lightning bolt coming all the way down, hitting that array on the top of a house, hitting that generator, hitting that light pole. Do you really think that if you put a ground rod at the bottom of that light pole right here, come on, guys. I mean, I know that some of you guys watching this DVD or watching this live streaming or, or watching this on the internet are saying, uh, wait a minute, you can't possibly, just by yourself, honestly, you gotta, maybe nobody else, but you can't possibly think that a ground rod at the bottom of a pole protected the fixture on the top of the pole. There's just no way you can look at the graphic again. All right. I don't think so. Now, I've seen this. Look at this cute little little ground wire coming down the corner here, going to this little ground rod. Come on. You got to be kidding me. You're going to drive this. We got this huge pole that probably has anchor bolts that go down 15 feet in the concrete. Who knows how massive of a cage it is to hold this whole thing. It's all tied together. You got 12 of these bolts. You really think you're going to run a six-gauge wire or a four-gauge wire off of that? You're going to CAD weld it and stick it to something that you actually did something? 
And actually, Scott, I think you're the one that said last night that, one of you guys said last night that uh, an inspector made you drive a ground rod at a fiberglass pole. Was oh, that, that you, was Dennis? Dennis. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. A fiberglass pole. <clears throat> Come on. Eric? Mike, there is a comment from the field that uh, Generac does include ground rods in the instructions. The comment was made that Generac does include instructions, the grounding is in there. That was a, that's a video streaming guy making this comment. And my comment to you is you're probably wrong. Take a look at your new instructions. Generac has changed their instructions because I work, I am a consultant with Generac and my understanding is that the current instructions simply say the generator shall be grounded per the National Electrical Code. But I'm not doubting for a fact that that's what it was in Generac's instructions right. in the past. So I'm pretty comfortable. But if Gen now here's the problem, Mike, what do you do? If I do have a generator and the instructions say you have to ground the generator, then guess what you have to do? Scott, what do you got to do? You're the code you gotta, guy. You got to do it. You got to do it. Is that a good idea? No, no. But the problem is it's the old liability problem. Manufacturer's instructions come with it. You follow the manufacturer's instructions, but do not forget to follow the NEC as well. All right. Let's take a look at this. This is something I recently received in an email and some documentation and this is what was said in the material about this product that was designed for grounding. Let's read it. Sparks, okay? Bonding. Connect components together to eliminate voltage differences. Would you agree that if we tie components together, there'll be the difference in voltage between the two components will be eliminated? Yes. So like if we're in a boat, in a fiberglass boat, and have all metal parts in the fiberglass boat all connected together and the shaft and the motor and the rudder and everything's connected together and a guy hooks up shore power and he, he makes a mistake in the connection and he makes the equipment grounding conductor as the hot conductor and he plugs it in, will everything in the boat be energized and the person standing in this fiberglass boat will not feel any voltage at all? True. So the problem is this what? <clears throat> the rudder, the shaft, the propeller, they're connected to the motor which is connected to the electrical system, it's what? It's 120 volts. And that's what happened to one guy. He ended up killing his wife, his daughter, and one other daughter survived. They, got, they drowned because, remember when you drive a ground rod, you put 120 volts, you get this voltage gradient immediately around the electrode, and then it gets more parallel paths. Same thing happens in water, particularly fresh water. Not salt water, particularly in, it happens, but the danger happens in fresh water. So bonding does bring things together between the two parts, but the problem is you might be standing on the earth, touching something that's bonded, and then you're dead. Let's look at the next part of this. So the concept of bonding is true. The statement on grounding. Attaching a ground reduces the possibility of voltage on equipment in the first place. If I tie these two things together, and now they're both energized, and I drive a ground rod, does that mean now I remove the voltage oh, from no. the parts? No. Here's another one. Step potential. Placing ground devices in locations that are not usually frequented minimizes the resistance of the ground to minimize the voltage rise and possibly a danger step potential. If I drive a ground rod and I connect to something, does that mean I'm not going to have any voltage between the metal parts and the earth or the step potential? No. Bonding devices together so there are multiple grounding points can lower overall resistance to ground and minimize step potential difference. In other words, the more ground you put, well, then now you don't have to worry about touching that because you, 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 you got a generator and you put five ground rods all over the place. And, of course, there's a, oh, no, we have this, uh, Eric, yours was a CNC machine, okay? And so we, we put one ground and then they had a problem disconnecting the equipment grounding conductor. So they want to put more equipment grounding, more grounding electrodes, more electrodes around that to make sure it's safe. No, you just can kill yourself in more places. <coughs> so that's a false statement on that one. Touch potential. Grounding. Minimizes ground resistance, will re help trip breakers faster, minimize the duration of hazard. And that's like the number one thing you could possibly say wrong. It keeps the voltage rise to a minimum, also reducing the hazard. Absolutely false. Bonding devices together so there are multiple ground points will lower the overall resistance to the ground, limiting voltage rise and duration of hazard. That is false. This is the problem that I'm dealing with. This is the problem that you guys are dealing with in the field and everybody else that is drinking this Kool-Aid here. And that is that you go to try to talk to somebody and they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. Electrons take the path of least resistance. Ground. All the stuff that you just saw, I just showed you a brochure. If you got that brochure and you try to call the manufacturer, which I did, and you try to explain to the guy, you're going to kill somebody. Stop with your advertising. Stop promoting this. Don't do this. 
I found out, and last night we were having dinner, and Eric was saying something about a welder, and then later on it occurred to me, when I talked to this guy, this guy is a welder. They came up with this device. Eric, you want to tell us a quick story? Hopefully it'll be <coughs> relevant, and I won't have to cut you off of the video. <laughs> tell us about <laughs> welding and the concepts of welding that maybe somebody might, a welder might have thought that that was true. I made a presentation a long time ago that I had to make it very quick, and so I'll do the same one here. A welding machine is nothing more than a portable electron pump. All it does is pumps electrons into a weld, and whichever, <clears throat> whatever electron goes into the weld has to come back to the same machine. It's a closed loop. <clears throat> People think that <clears throat> you weld and the spark ends at, at the point at the gap. Everything has to come right back into the machine. So it's a portable electron pump, and whatever, you, whatever, you, whatever electrons you put in the system have to get but back. Why would the welder think something is ground? <clears throat> ah, because <clears throat> in the welding, a lot of times what happens is you have your two leads, what you're, called your stinger lead where your welding rod is. A lot of other people call the other one a ground lead. <clears throat> but actually, if you go to Lincoln, Hobart, or Miller websites, they all say, do not call it a ground lead, call it a work lead, because it connects to your work. It's for the purpose. It connects of, to the metal part that you're <clears throat> welding. Yes, or it's the for the table per that it's. <clears throat> that's right. It's for the purpose of bringing the electrons, if you will, the current, back into the machine. But if you call it a ground lead, then people are thinking, "Oh, I need to find some ground mm -hmm. to connect it to." You don't connect well, it to the ground. Well, if you do that, you really have a problem now, that's right? That's right. Because now you got <clears throat> you take a welder, current goes out, comes back. You don't connect it on the table, but you connect it to the building somewhere, right? Because you need ground. Right. And then all of a sudden you connect this. Now you're welding here. Now those electrons are going where? All through your motor bearings. All over the, yeah. all over the place to get over to somehow. Who knows? You might have a fire somewhere in the building because you got current traveling in this building because the guy thought, I'm going to put this to ground, right? And that's, that makes the machine work because the machine needs ground to work. And I'm just going to have the electrons go out one way, not realizing, no, no, no. It goes out. It's going all over this building and getting back. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was excellent.